You're looking at one of the unlikeliest environmental experiments on Earth. 15 years ago, people planted 30 million native trees across land so degraded it was considered beyond recovery. No irrigation systems, no new water source, just trees fighting ancient soils, rising salinity, and a climate built for deserts. And yet today, imagery shows green corridors cutting across Western Australia like veins reconnecting a broken system. The results are real and shocking. If this works here, what does it mean for every other collapsing landscape on the planet? Australia sits directly under the subtropical high pressure belt, the same atmospheric system that created the Sahara Desert. Dry air sinks here year after year, keeping rainfall scarce across the interior. And unlike other continents, Australia's soils are ancient. We're talking hundreds of millions of years old. About 300 million years of rain have washed away most nutrients. It's a naturally harsh environment. Most moisture from the ocean never makes it inland. It falls on the coast and stops. But what turned harsh into catastrophic was what happened starting in the 1800s. European settlers arrived and saw endless space. They cleared land for wheat and livestock on an industrial scale. In Western Australia's wheat belt alone, somewhere between 90 and 97% of native vegetation was removed. 97%. Imagine stripping almost an entire region bare. Now, those native plants had spent millennia adapting to terrible soil. Their root systems held everything together. When they were removed, the fragile soils had nothing anchoring them. Erosion accelerated. Water tables rose without deep tree roots to absorb moisture, bringing salt to the surface. Farmland became salinized, unproductive, essentially poisoned by its own groundwater and the wildlife that had survived in those native ecosystems, they were left with isolated habitat patches, little islands surrounded by cleared agricultural land with nowhere to go. What followed was a cascading collapse. Remove native vegetation, soil erodes, rising water tables bring salt, habitat fragments into isolated islands. Wildlife populations decline because they can't move between patches. And here's the economic reality that nobody wanted to admit for decades. Much of this cleared land was marginal farmland from the start. The soils were too poor, the rainfall too unreliable. Farmers struggled. The land degraded further. It was a losing battle. By the 1990s and 2000s, people started recognizing something uncomfortable. This land didn't need more clearing. It needed restoration. But here's the insight that changed everything. You can't just restore isolated patches and expect ecosystems to recover. Animals need to move. Plants need genetic exchange. You need connectivity. You need corridors. That realization led to something unprecedented, a series of massive biodiversity corridor projects that would attempt to stitch the landscape back together. The question was, could it actually work? Fast forward to today and four massive restoration projects are underway across Western Australia and South Australia. First, the Yarra Yarra Biodiversity Corridor, launched in 2008 in the Northern Wheat Belt. This is where those 30 million trees came from. More than 21,000 hectares have been restored. That's a 200 kilometer corridor reconnecting 12 nature reserves that had been isolated for a century. The project has planted 30 million native trees and shrubs, projected to capture 1.5 million tons of CO2 projected over the project's lifespan, with trees protected by 100-year covenants. It's also created over 400 jobs, including 50 indigenous positions, turning ecological restoration into an actual economy. Then there's the Gondwana Link, started in 2002, and it's the most ambitious of all. The goal is a 1,000-kilometer corridor stretching from the wet forests of the southwest coast all the way to the arid Null Arbor Plain. They've already purchased over 16,000 hectares for conservation and actively restored 13,500 hectares. This project is literally trying to reconnect two of Australia's most significant national parks, Stirling Range and Fitzgerald River, creating a continuous pathway for species to move. The third project is Covalent Land's Mega Plantings. In 2025 alone, they completed the largest single-year native tree planting in Australia, 3,000 hectares. Their model is driven by carbon credits. 
Over five years, they plan to plant 7,000 hectares, roughly 3 million trees, funded by corporate partnerships with companies like Woodside Energy and Silva Capital. This is where climate finance meets conservation. And finally, Talia Station on the Eyre Peninsula in South Australia. This is 688 hectares focused on restoring endangered drooping she-oak woodland. What makes it different is the indigenous partnership with the Warangu and the Nao Aboriginal Corporation, integrating traditional cultural burning practices into modern restoration. It's projected to generate 114,000 carbon credits while bringing back ecosystems that had nearly vanished. Together, these projects represent nearly 38,000 hectares actively being restored right now. That's real ground, real trees, real change. So what does this look like for the people involved? For farmers and landowners facing unviable land, the projects have created an unexpected lifeline. According to Carbon Neutral, the organization behind Yara Yara, they've been able to employ farmers who would have otherwise had to abandon their properties. In some cases, the same families who cleared the land generations ago are now being paid to restore it, staying on their land, keeping their homes, just doing different work. For workers, it's transformed into a genuine employment sector. Over 400 jobs in planting, monitoring, and maintenance. Indigenous workers are reconnecting with ancestral land through paid conservation work, more than 50 positions across the projects. And for scientists, it's a living laboratory. Walk through a restored section of Gondwana Link today and you'll see GPS collared western gray kangaroos moving between reserves that were isolated for 80 years. Researchers using night cameras have spotted the Woolies Falls Antichinus, a carnivorous marsupial so rare it doesn't even have a common name yet, appearing in the wheat belt for the first time on record. Every data point matters because if it works here, in one of Earth's harshest climates, the model can be exported globally. Here's why this model is spreading. It's a reinforcing loop. Trees get planted, carbon gets captured, carbon credits get sold. That revenue funds more restoration, more habitat returns, wildlife populations recover. Studies have valued the biodiversity co-benefits alone at 28 to 63 million Australian dollars. The economic activity generated between 18 and 30 million dollars attracts even more investment. It's a positive feedback loop that compounds over time. And because it works on marginal land, it's not competing with productive farms. That makes it politically feasible and economically replicable. Other countries dealing with land degradation are studying this model closely. So can this scale? There are three possible futures. Scenario A, current trends continue. Projects expand steadily, reaching around 100,000 hectares by 2035. You'd see visible green corridors, measurable carbon capture, recovering wildlife populations, but it would still be a small fraction of the millions of hectares that were cleared. Scenario B, acceleration. Carbon credit prices rise significantly, triggering a massive investment surge, more corporate partnerships and stronger government support. Under this scenario, you could restore 500,000 or more hectares by 2050. That would be landscape scale transformation entire regions greening on satellite imagery. Scenario C, the resilience test. Extended droughts push survival rates below 40% in some corridors. Catastrophic fires test which restoration strategies actually work. Under this scenario, the projects either prove they can withstand intensifying climate extremes, the same conditions that made restoration necessary in the first place, or they fail. We find out if you can truly reverse desertification at scale or if some damage is permanent. Remember that land considered beyond recovery? The terrain so degraded that most experts thought restoration was impossible? It's healing. Not everywhere, not perfectly, but across 200 kilometers of Western Australia's wheat belt, 30 million trees are reconnecting a broken system. Australia's geography created the harsh conditions in the first place, that subtropical high-pressure belt, those ancient soils leached of nutrients over 300 million years. Human clearing made it catastrophically worse. 97% of native vegetation stripped away in barely a century, leaving behind salt-crusted earth and isolated habitat islands. But this highly unlikely experiment is proving something fundamental. Even in one of Earth's harshest landscapes, strategic restoration can reverse the damage. No irrigation, no miracle technology, 
just understanding which trees evolve to survive terrible soils and where to plant them so wildlife can move again. Geography created the wound. Geography is proving it knows how to heal it. If you want to see more geography stories, hit that subscribe button. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, share, and leave a comment. I read them all. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.